Hey everyone, uh, welcome to another episode of Podcasting for Business. Today's show is going to be amazingly cool because I have a podcast hall of famer in the house and we're going to be chatting about all the different things that podcasting has done over the last 18, 20 years, which I'm super excited about. But also on this show, um, we're going to talk about some really cool tactics uh, about launching your show. Uh, we have Rob Walsh in the house, who is the VP of uh, Libsyn and partnerships at Libsyn and has been around for 18 years, I found out. And um, I just finished my 10th year and I, I thought that was cool. But 18 years is a lot of time in podcasting. So we're going to get some thoughts on that. Um, I'm going to show you a tool that is going to make your content creation a lot easier. And um, if this is the first time you're coming across the show, uh, you can become part of the show if you have a podcast and you have a business and you have some sort of case studies on how the podcast has helped or hindered your business growth. And I'd love to hear from you. So if you can send us a comment or a DM, uh, we'd love to hear about your story and maybe feature you on the show. And also, if you disagree with anything that we're saying here or agree with something that we're saying here, mention that in the comments. Uh, you can find the edited version of this show uh, on should I start a podcast.com or any of the podcast platforms. But let's get into the show. Today, we have Rob Walsh in the house, who, by the way, has been around for a long time, has done way too many podcasts, has been published way too many times, and has been involved in this space for for ages. So let's get Rob onto the show. Rob, how, how are you doing? Welcome. Good, Rosie. Thanks for having me back and great yeah. to talk to you again, sir. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's exciting. Every time I do these revisions of my show, I feel like um, a, a improvement, but also feel in the space of being lost a little bit because I'm not trying something new. So what I would love to start off with is um, what have you seen in terms of your changes starting way back uh, 18 years ago? Uh, what has changed and what comes to mind when you think of that change from the last 18 years? Well, I mean, things have changed a lot. I mean, when I started, there was no Apple podcast. There was no iTunes support for podcasts. There wasn't even, you know, when I started working on my podcast, it was October 2004, Libsyn hadn't even launched yet. Libsyn didn't launch for another month. Um, so it, there was no clear, easy way to podcast. There was no tutorials. The only article out there was one from Engadget which came out in the beginning of October, 2004. And literally it said, if you want a podcast, just take this enclosure tag and put it in your RSS feed and you're a podcaster. And I was like, what did they just say? Uh, so that, you know, so I think what really has changed is the amount of information. Nobody knew what a podcast was either. Right. And, and over the years it's gone from, let me explain what a podcast is to have you heard about a podcast or maybe you've heard of podcasting to what podcast do you listen to? Right. So now I don't even ask people if they know what a podcast is. I say, what are some of the podcasts you listen to? And, and everybody pretty much I've asked in the last year or two has something they said they listen to. So I think that's really where it's changed most. Well, it, it feels like over COVID, more people have started to listen to podcasts and it's become more and more popular. Is that what you've noticed? Uh, or is it just me being really excited about the fact that I've been trying to get people into podcasting for the last 10 years? No, no, COVID definitely brought about more people listening to podcasts. Now, it initially brought a bunch of people into podcasting to do a podcast who then quickly left the space because they go, wow, this is tougher than I thought. And they mm. did one or two or five episodes and, and were gone. Mm. Um, some made it even 50 episodes, made it a year. Uh, we saw a big drop off a year after COVID uh, initially launched or initially rolled out, you know, like March, April of 2020 we saw a big uptick of people starting to podcast because all they suddenly had free time four mm. five, ten hours extra a week, right? not having to commute. Mm. And a year later, we saw a bunch drop off. Mm. Uh, they got a year in, they said, oh, I'm not making any money. I'm going to quit. Mm. And sometimes uh, that's not the right way to look at it. It's not just making money. It's directly sometimes it's indirectly from your podcast. So let's talk about that because pod fade is obviously a real thing. I mean, we all have been through it in some form, whether it's um, 
the lack of bringing money in or the lack of seeing opportunities as a result of putting all this effort or is the lack of maybe having um, creativity to come up with the next piece of content. It, this pod fade seems to be uh, around and especially for new podcasters getting into uh, the space, what kind of leads to that point of pod fade? How can we kind of set ourselves up to not get there? Or how can we start off with someone who's just starting off and kind of going, well, I definitely don't want to stop after six or seven episodes, which is the, you know, the current standard, mm -hmm. I think seven episodes. Um, I want to keep going. I want to go further than 50 episodes. What, how do we start? How do we start with the right frame of mind and the right sort of motivation to keep this going right some people will come to me and they'll say hey what is a hot topic what are the people listening to those people aren't going to make it 10 episodes because mm. they don't realize how much hard work it is and now you're going to have to do this work for this topic each week that you're not passionate about when i was doing today in ios every week when i was releasing that every week i would script out my episodes i was doing eight to 10,000 words a week for my script. If I said to you, hey, you have to write an eight to 10,000 page report every week, you'd be like, oh. And now on top of that, you have to read what you wrote. You've got to edit that. You've got to get it right. And you got to get it out. And it's on a topic that you're not really passionate about, but someone else might be. And, and, and there's no guarantee you're going to get any audience gee, why do these people pod fade before 10 episodes? I, I can't imagine. Mm. Right? So mm. the, the first thing you can do to, to keep from pod fading is say, what do I want to listen to? What are the podcasts that are interest me? What would I want to hear? Forget what other people are thinking. There's seven plus billion people in the world. If you like something, you can find a group of people that are going to like it as well. So you might as well go with something you like. And then yeah. start there and and do something you even have maybe have an inside knowledge base on um yeah and then after that set your expectations correct and you know another reason people pod fade is they look at their numbers right that's the ones that pod fade at 50 episodes a lot of times and they look at their numbers and they go oh i've been doing this a year and and i got 600 listeners to my podcast and, and uh, you know i just can't get above 600. i'm like but your podcast is on pneumatic valves how many did you think you were going to get, right? Yeah. If you were to go to a conference and you had 600 people in your room that you're speaking to, would you consider that a successful conference, a visit? Yeah, you'd probably spend a couple thousand dollars to fly to that event, to get there, stay at a nice hotel and do a speech to 600 people. Now you're doing it every week to 600 people, every week from your house. You didn't have to travel. And when people look at it from that perspective, it tends to bring things back in, into reality. Like, hey, I'm actually doing okay. Mm. So that perspective is really important because you know one of the things that I do say to when I'm presenting, because uh, I get this question a lot, um, and I'm, I'm I'm really keen to get your thoughts on it because uh, what I get a lot is isn't podcasting saturated? And uh, <laughs> I'd love to get your thoughts on that first before I t tell you what I kind of uh, come back with that on that on that on that question. Yeah, I, I, that number, that saturated number comes from these BS numbers that are put out, like uh, Spotify just said they have 4.4 .4 million podcasts and Podcast Index says it has 4 million and Apple Podcasts says it has 2.4 million podcasts. But that's just RSS feeds that are, act, that are working. Doesn't mean they're actually releasing content. If you actually look at the shows that are releasing content, that number, that 2.4 million in Apple Podcasts, that drops down to about 473,000 that have released a new episode in the last 90 days. Now, interesting, here's what's really interesting. You take that number that's released an episode in the last 90 days, and then you go over to Podcast Index, which has another 1.6 million shows, and their number of active podcasts is 1,000 more. So 1.6 million podcasts additional in the podcast index really only equate to 1,000 more podcasts that are releasing content in the last 90 days. 
There's crazy. less than 500,000 active podcasts that have released content in the last 90 days. And if you take it one step further and you go to how many have 10 episodes or more, so real active podcasts, you know, releasing content and have actual content in their feed, not just, hey, is this mic working? <laughs> uh, hello. Hey, mom, I'm a podcaster, right? Beyond that, actual really releasing content, the number drops down to about 380,000. Wow. And here's what's really interesting. That number is almost identical to where it was on January 1st, 2021. In 18 plus months, the n number of active podcasts with 10 or more episodes has not changed. So no, the podcasting space isn't saturated. It's a smaller number than people think. And when you compare that 400,000 to the 750 million blogs in the world, it's a really tiny number. Mm. Well, yeah, that's um, that's way better explanation than what I would say. I would normally say, "Hey, in the next in the next minute, I'm going to remove two thirds of your po of of your competition. How about that? So, if you start a podcast right now, in the next minute, I'm going to give you information that's going to remove two thirds of your competition, and I'm going to I say to them, like, you know." Only two thirds of uh, actually, there's two thirds of podcasts out there that have seven or less episodes, which means you're only competing with the one third of, of podcasts. But it seems like right now it's only like ten percent, if less, that you're competing with of what the actual number is out 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 in the world. Less than ten percent of the podcasts in the podcast index have released a new episode in in, in the last ninety days. You know, or and, and then and then when you add on top of that you know, three plus 10 or more episodes, it really is, it's less than 10%. That's, that's, that's crazy. It's, that, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and that's why pe people throw around these numbers. Oh, this place has this number of shows and this place has that number of shows. You know, people compare Libsyn to uh, some other hosts and, and one of these other hosts, we do half a billion downloads with the shows that we host. The other place has 60% more shows and they have a hundred million downloads. So we get five times more downloads and they have 60% more shows. And, and on average, I mean, the average podcast on Libsyn gets over seven or eight times more downloads than the average podcast on, you know, Buzzsprout. Yeah. Just, just throw that out there. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about media hosts because uh, obviously the main thing that a podcaster needs to start off is a media host. And there's a lot of questions around what media hosts to, to start off with. I have exclusively used Libsyn since for the last 10 years, which is crazy. And Thanks. I feel like um, some of the questions that come uh, that come my way, I'm not in a position to answer because I haven't checked out Buzzsprout, uh, Buzzsprout or Anchor for that matter or any, any, any other one. So I feel like not in a position to kind of answer any of these questions where when they kind of say things like... Um, what is the interface like? Is it better to use Buzzsprout over the other ones? But let's, I mean, obviously from a Libsyn point of view, let's talk about media hosting. You have been around for the longest time. It is what I call the industry standard, um, although people don't agree with me anymore. But let's talk about media hosting, the advantages, the disadvantages. When someone's starting a podcast, how do they need to look at it? And why is Libsyn in a better place to help them as opposed to the other ones? One, we have been around the longest and we've delivered more downloads than any other podcast host in the history of the space. And it's not even close. Um, so, you know, there's the longevity. If you host with us, you don't have to worry about moving your podcast. You don't have to worry about getting charged more if you're on Libsyn.com because your podcast got popular. Some other services, you have to look into the terms of service and find out, oh, if my show gets popular, I'm going to get charged more. Well, you know, that's not the case with Lipson. We're not going to charge you more. We want you to be successful. We're not going to penalize you for it. Um, then the other thing is if you want to make money, if you do want to monetize, we have the tools to help you monetize. We've bought advertised cast. We acquired podcast ad reps. Uh, we've got a couple other acquisitions working that we'll announce soon around the advertising sales side of things just to help you monetize your show. And then we've got, my Libsyn and glow.fm uh, on the premium side to help you monetize that way. If you want to get a smartphone app for your podcast, you know, you're not going to get that from other places. You get your own smartphone app with Libsyn. So iOS and Android, which means your show is now discoverable 
to the three billion or two and a half billion people that download apps every month, uh, you know, that may not yet know what a podcast is outside the U.S. Um, or some of the other countries where podcasting is popular. So this is just a different thing you get with Libsyn. And then on top of that, the stats and the destinations, and you get to control exactly where your content goes and when it goes out. So, you know, we feel we have some great tools and it's uh, tools for podcasters by podcasters. I mean, we've been there, we've gone through all this and, you know, we want to make sure as a podcaster, when we create tools for you, it's going to help you save you time because at the end of the day, that's what it's really about, right? Your time is your money. And we want to make sure you get through where you can upload an episode, put in the title, put in the description, hit publish or schedule it for release really quick, really easy. Yeah. And, and I mean, I've been doing this, like I said, for 10 years, it feels like uh, intuitive to me, but because I've done probably it, cause I've done it so often, it kind of feels like just, you know, the next step after the, uh, after the next, um, I, I, I really want to get into the new kid on the block, which is anchor and the, the, uh, the lure of getting people to anchor, uh, not pay for hosting, getting this, the, getting the, their podcast on there. And now from what I understand is that they uh, are allowing video podcasts to, to be published. So if you, if you have a video podcast, then you can publish that straight up on, on Spotify. I could be wrong, um, mm -hmm. uh, through anchor, but let's talk about anchor, how they came into the space and your thoughts on, um, their activity in the podcast space. Well, yeah. If you go and look at the podcasts that are from Anchor, the majority, the vast majority, well over 90% are dead podcasts. Um, you know, it, there are millions of dead shows that released one or two episodes, three or four at the most. And, and most of actually the majority of them are one episode and, and then died. That's not a podcast. I mean, yeah, it's an episode, it's an RSS feed, it's out there. But if it released one or two episodes ever, and then hasn't done anything, is it really a podcast? Mm. And, and now, you know, I, I, people ask me to come on the shows and, and and be guests on the shows all the time. If you host on Anchor, I don't go because I just assume the show's not gonna be around in two weeks, three weeks. Yeah. So there's that issue. You know, it's, it's, it, it's the joke is, it, it, you know, having an, your RSS feed on Anchor is like having an AOL email address mm. um, because there's so many of these dead shows. Um, is it, is it a place where you can go and, and, and learn and then move off? Sure. We have people moving over to us all the time from Anchor because they want to take their show to the next level. They want to have better control of their show. They want better control of the feed. And we've always supported video as well. And we support PDF. So Libsyn supports audio, video, PDF. You get a blog page. You can bring in your own custom domain. So we, we let you can fully control your branding. Mm. We're not going to put our, our logo on top of your artwork or anything like that. Um, we want it to be about you, not about us. So let's compare these two um, uh, hosting platforms. I mean, you, you mentioned how people start off with Anchor and then want, they come over to Libsyn to take it to the next level. What does that mean? Because I know a lot of people who are on Anchor and continuously ask me the question, like, why are you paying money to host your podcast when you can do it for free? and get um, access to Anchor and Spotify because um, Spotify has bought Anchor. And I don't really have a, a great answer for them. And I really love to be able to give them a better answer than I've been with Lipsyn for the last 10 years. Yeah, look, you can look around, you can find free food, right? But if you want a good meal, you're going to go pay for it. You get what you pay for. Um, and the cost uh, of it isn't that much. You're talking $15, $20 a month to host. Uh, with Libsyn and that's going to give that. you better, right? Yeah. And, and yeah, we have plans that start at five and, and what you're getting is the most reliable podcast hosting service. You're getting the one that's going to give you the best statistics. So you're going to get great stats and you're going to have options for a lot of different tools. You can, if you want to do the premium, we can take you down the premium road. Um, we can help you get into more places, more destinations. We have integrations with, with Ghana and GeoSavin and Deezer and all these other places uh, that, you know, we have support all the Apple uh, 
tools, including the Apple's new premium, which you don't get that option with with Spotify, uh, with Anchor. All right. So you can't if you want to have premium and you want to upload it directly to Anchor and have it go right to Apple, you can't do that. With Libsyn, we are one of the six companies that Apple announced that will be able to do that. So you know, we're giving you some features there. And again, if you want to have a smartphone app, that's not something you're going to be able to get with Anchor. Mm. You can't bring in your own custom domain. Those are dif- different things that you can't do. The prepends, if you want to bring in a prepend or a prefix, uh, such as, uh, you know, uh, in the front of your, your uh, like a pod track or a blueberry prefix, um, those aren't supported over there either at Anchor. So with Anchor, the, there was a... Um... I don't know whether it was a myth, but there was a, a, a rumor going around about how um, Anchor actually you don't own your content on Anchor. Is that true? Like, it, does, does Anchor own your it, artists? It, yeah. In the original terms of service that Anchor released, they were horrendous and horrible and they got called out for it and there was articles about it and the terms of service basically said that they anchor was free to do anything they wanted with your content share it with anyone they wanted transfer it to anyone they wanted so the original terms of service and i don't know where they are today but the original terms of service were abysmal mm. and, that, and that's why and they got called and they got called out for it and there was some couple of articles that were written about that got it got it so that 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 was uh, what i used to say and 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 now apparently that has um from what I understand from the people that are on Anchor, are like, oh, no, that's not a thing anymore. And I said, okay, well, let me get someone on the show that can actually explain uh, the big difference. Because I feel like, first of all, podcasting to someone that's just getting into it, there's a lot of spinning plates, right? That's why people fade quite often. They kind of get into it and realize there's way too much work. If they don't know how to manage it properly, if they have no systems in place, if they haven't done it before, they don't get help. Um with media hosting, it, it's almost like um, people either get stuck in the in 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 making the decision as to which one to choose, or they pick one that um, they want to change later. And from what I understand, your stats don't get moved over. Uh, for example, I. Um, and, I, and I could be entirely wrong on that because when we started We Are Podcast in 2015, Audio Boom was our sponsor and they had given us um, hosting, which should I start a podcast was hosted on that site first. And then I moved over to Libsyn maybe a year in after 500,000-ish downloads and that those numbers didn't get transferred. Maybe it was more than a year later. Uh, didn't get transferred over to Libsyn. And from what I understand, they don't get transferred. So is that an issue for people that are moving from one place to the other? Not not really. You take a screenshot of where your stats were, and now you know where they were, and you move. Um, advertisers don't really care about what your stats are from the past. They want to know what's your stats going to be going forward, right? Advertisers aren't going to ask you for, hey, give me the download numbers um, for these episodes plus these older ones. They want to know what happened from this certain date forward, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the date that they're running the campaign on. Mm-hmm. So if you're, you're moving over and you're concerned about stats, moving from any service, from Libsyn to another service or another service to Libsyn, stats shouldn't be the, the, the gating factor. Again, you can take screenshots, you can drop those down into a spreadsheet, you can pull them off to the side, Depends on the service you're, you're with. Um, you know, Libsyn, we make it easy to export your stats. Yeah. Uh, but it just, I, that's not something. And, and you, you're really not going to get a- accurate stats, even if you were able to take them from one place to another, because everybody parses the raw server logs different. So, you know, what, what is 100 downloads or 1,000 downloads on one service might be 998 on another, might be 1,002 on another. And if it's not IEB certified, it could be a, well, 2,020. <laughs> Mm. Um, yeah, well, we've seen that before. We, we've seen people go, oh, well, we're, uh, the services, they'll say, our service is IAB compliant. Well, first off, there's no such thing. I was on the committee that wrote the spec. Um, and matter of fact, we rewrote in the spec to say, if you want to say you're IAB compliant, you have to be IAB certified. So these companies that say they're IAB compliant but not certified, it's not accurate. Um, and we saw a company that was saying they were compliant moved and got their stats certified and their numbers dropped 75%. Wow. Although they said they were compliant beforehand, after actually going through the compliance, making the changes needed to become compliant, 
their stats drop 75 percent let's uh for context for people who don't know what that is what is the iab uh certification and how do you get compliant iab certification iab stands for interactive advertising bureau and it's a global organization and they have a standard iab v2 2.1 for stats and and this is a guideline for stats that recommends that the host to be compliant and certified you, you have to filter on a 24-hour basis so that means if a, a, a specific ip address user agent comes in and requests the file that if that same ip address and user agent comes in again in the next 24 hours or in that 24-hour window depending on how they filter um, that you don't count it the second time or the third time. So there's the filtering that brings down the numbers for some folks. Then there's also blacklists and you can only get access to the blacklist if you're IAB certified if you're, or you're going through the certification process. That's the only way to get access to those blacklists. So those blacklists have IP addresses that are bots, known bots and user agents that are known bots and you filter some of these things out to get you to a more accurate number. Mm. And, and in, in the IAB stats, it's not considered a download unless one minute of data has been delivered. So it's not just filtering on the IP address and user agent, it's also filtering on the fact that at least one minute of content was delivered. And so if someone doesn't know how to measure for one minute worth of content, which is usually the case, that's usually the one that gets them, um, then their numbers are gonna be greatly inflated. So someone might just come in for a head head range request and someone go, oh, well, that's, I, I delivered a byte range, account it, right? Um, that's not the accurate number. The accurate number, again, is per the IEB filtering over a 24 hour window or in a 24 hour calendar day for unique requests from the same IP address user agent, at least one minute of data and that the requesters aren't from one of the blacklists. Mm. So, so can I understand this right? That if you are not IAB compliant, your stats can be very off to off, off, way off, way off, way off. And and you said six of the media hosts are IAB uh, compliant. Oh, no, there's more than six. No, no, there's more. If you if you go and in there, you, you'll see the different hosts that are IAB compliant. Like Libsyn is, of course, and, and uh, Blueberry is, and, and Omni, and uh, Acast, and, and others are IAB compliant. You can go and look at the list on the IAB site for all those that are compliant. But there are some that are not, and they quote unquote say they are compliant, and then they're not. It's not true. You have to be on that list that's certified, and you have to go through the certification process for those stats to count. And advertisers will not for the most part nowadays, won't look at stats unless they are from a host that, uh, that is IAB certified. Yeah, and is Anchor on that list? Yeah, Anchor is, yes, yes. Yeah, okay, great. So let, let's let's talk about um, this. I mean, we, we, we spoke about um, media hosting, we spoke about uh, the, the landscape, I suppose. I, I wanna get into new podcasters getting into podcasting, especially the doing it for a business because, um, I mean, you can start a podcast about knitting and just do it and, and feel fine doing it. But if you're doing it for a reason to grow your business, then there's a different way to look at, 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 at starting a podcast. I'd love to know what, in your opinion, from seeing this so often and being in the space for 18 years, what is the psychology of a new podcaster getting into podcasting without having the experience, I suppose, like what <laughs> what sort of um, assumptions do they make? And then with those assumptions, what kind of roadblocks do they land up coming up against? You know, when I see new businesses that are coming in and, and, and starting a podcast, they often are worried about the wrong thing. And the wrong thing is worrying about the sound. Now, I'm not saying don't worry about sound. Sound is important. But if if you're concerned about the sound, you're probably not concerned about the content. And the content is the right thing. So make sure you work out the sound recording before you ever release your first episode. By the time you go to release your first episode, you should not be worried about the sound. That should have been something you worked out long ago. Do mm -hmm. test recordings, do whatever you have to do. So that first episode comes out you shouldn't be at all concerned about the sound quality. That should be something that's taken care of. Mm -hmm. Now you should only be concerned about the content. Mm. 
And one of the biggest mistakes I have seen businesses do that create a podcast is they go out and hire this great sounding voice, someone from radio to come in and talk about their product and interview people in their industry. The problem is that person that came off of radio might sound good, but they don't know your product. And it's easier to teach somebody inside your company how to sound good on a microphone than it is to teach this person that sounds good on a microphone about pneumatic valves mm. or quartz crystal oscillators. <laughs> and, and why that is so important is no matter how good an interviewer someone might be, the most important question an interviewer is going to ask, interviewer is going to ask someone they're interviewing, is the follow-up question. Yeah. And the follow-up question only comes from people that know the topic really well. Yeah. So if you're a business and you're starting a podcast, don't look outside. Don't look at hiring somebody to be the voice of your podcast. Look in your company and figure out who will feel comfortable doing it and who is really knowledgeable of your product base. Because that's ultimately what's going to make a good podcast is having someone who's knowledgeable. You can teach them how to have good mic presence. You can teach them how to stop saying, um, as you know, you can hire an editor to get rid of the ums, as you knows. You can use Descript to do that for, for the most part as well. Yeah. There's, there's tools and tricks, but you can't teach, you can't hire someone to ask that follow-up question. That's just based on knowledge of your product. And and also knowledge in the in, in the space and the, and the industry, I suppose, which um, may be one of the things that also does happen when someone is thinking of launching a podcast is that they assume that they're going to sound amazing and awesome and perfect from day one when they've never done a podcast before. And I kind of hope that you might have some tips and tricks and ideas to kind of maybe dispel that um, myth and 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 give someone in that position some um, hope that they will get better over the next 10, 15 episodes that they run. Yeah, you're going to get better. And that's why I said, you know, make a few recordings before you even do your first episode. You want to get used to talking on the mic. You want to make sure you find an environment that's quiet and it doesn't have echo and reverb off the walls. You're not getting rid of reverb, right? Flat walls, you have that echo reverb going. Good luck. You, the best editors out there aren't going to really clean up reverb all that well. Mm. Um, so you want to find an environment that is quiet, that isn't outside noise coming in, and, and there's no echoes going on. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't have to be a $2,500, $3,000 room like I'm sitting in here <laughs> that I built. Um, but it, it needs to be a decent room without flat walls, you know, it could be a cloak, it could be a closet where you have clothes in there, you know, that works well for people. It, but you, what you don't want is that corner conference room with the glass walls that echoes. Right? Yeah. You don't want that. Uh, you want a room with carpet, um, things like that, just to remember. So first thing is, and foremost, is finding a quiet space without echo. Yeah. That's really going to get you good. So next is don't use the mic that's in your laptop. Go out and spend a little bit of money on a microphone. Um, if you are someone that can stay on mic, you know, you know, grab a mic that you, you can talk to, but you want to find one that doesn't have hand noise. So, you know, the Shure SM58 is a really good mic that doesn't have hand noise. Uh, the Samsung Q2U is a good mic that doesn't have too much hand noise. Uh, I would stay away from the Audio Technica 2100 because it has a lot of hand noise. Hand noise means as you're holding it, that it comes through on, and you can hear it. Uh, matter of fact, if you can get the mic up, you know I've got my mic here, or where is it at? On yeah. on a on a boom arm. Right? Yeah. If you can be up on a boom arm, yeah. um, that that's ideal. So get that. Get a decent mic. Um, if you can stay on mic, sure SM58 is great. If you can't stay on mic, then you're going to need to find um, a, a condenser mic versus a dynamic mic. Yeah. Uh, I Right now, I'm using the Blue Yeti Pro. Uh, some people don't like the Blue Yetis, but those people that don't like the Blue Yetis are probably, it usually comes from their recording in a bad environment. Mm. Um, you know, you, you can have a really good audio quality from the Blue Yeti, and there's other really good mics out there. Sure, SM7B, if you want to spend a lot of money, but starting out, Samsung Q2U is a great mic to start out with. It's yeah. 70 bucks usually on Amazon mm. and, and um, or the, the Shure SM58, $99 Amazon or Guitar Center. Uh, and and it, it, it works. But 
if you're going to use the Shure SM58, you have to be willing to stay on the mic. You have to be willing to talk like this. Yeah. And not everybody can do that. I can't. I, yeah. I, that's why, I, I mean, I have it. It's great for mobile environments if you're going to be in a not quiet environment. But yeah. normally, I, I like to move around, so I want a condenser mic yeah. so that it picks yeah. up good if I'm here or if I'm here or if I'm here. Sure. And, and it does make a difference in, in the environment you're in. And, and I'm one of those people who um, have been asking people for a Blue Yeti so I can burn it and put it on my website because people get the Blue Yeti and have shitty sound because they don't know how to use it in the environment that they're in. And, and that makes the big difference. And I'm on a, a SM58 primarily because it is the gold standard for making sure that outside sound around uh, the, the mm -hmm. SM58 is not being picked up. So I can take it even to a park and mm -hmm. get an interview uh, out of someone which sounds quite amazing, uh, even though you can hear some of the outside sounds of, of the park. But um, to your point, like knowing the kind of microphone you have and the equipment you have and what it does and where it picks up your sound and picks up your audio is is a factor to sounding good when it when the when the podcast does come out. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know this SM58. I, I joke. I, I did, did an interview with Dr. Tiki from Tiki Bar TV in a tiki bar on a Saturday night using two Shure SM58s, and you could barely hear the background noise. And it was a Saturday night in a tiki bar, and it was not quiet. Mm. So um, you know, if you have the right mic, you can you can do a decent recording. But just starting out, again, get a nice quiet room. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to cover this for the next five minutes, if you don't mind. You've done an amazing presentation for us at the last We Are podcast, which was about launching your podcast in 30 days. If I could get a condensed version. So for, what I mean by that is someone's thinking of launching a podcast and they want to do it right. What steps, you mentioned environment, you mentioned microphone, we've got that sorted. Uh, we also, you also mentioned not starting something that they're not going to listen to, uh, when you're starting off. So making sure that you're creating something that you're passionate about. What's the next step? How can we get people to launch better so that they can keep going and not have the pod fade? One of the most important things is creating a trailer episode and getting that submitted everywhere a month before your launch date. Start submitting to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Ghana, Geosop, and all the different places. You want to start that process a month before your launch date. And the reason is Google Podcasts takes up to two weeks to get approved. Apple Podcasts used to take two weeks. It, now they're approving in one or two days. But even after you get approved at Apple, there's still the point in time for it to get indexed to all the places that pull from Apple's directory. So Overcast and CastBox and Pocket Cast, they all pull from Apple's podcast directory. So getting into Apple isn't just getting into Apple. You're getting into 200 or so more apps that pull from Apple's directory. So getting your trailer into Apple, getting it into all the other places. So you know, a month before your launch date. So when that month date comes, you already have URLs for all the different applications of where your podcast is located. You already know that your show is going to show up when you release that first real episode and you're not worried about it happening. I mean, I've had people come to me and go on a Friday, say, Hey, we need to create an account because we have a big launch on Monday. And I say, no, you, you don't have a launch on Monday. <laughs> and, and then they're like, no, we do. And I'm like, no, you really don't. And, and then I have to explain to them why they don't. Um, so you want to take that time and get ahead, ahead of it. And, and the trailer is simply saying what the show, Show is going to be about who the target audience is for thanking them for following and subscribing your show and asking them to come back on the certain date and to let their friends know about the show that's all you have to do and don't worry about your show being discovered you know that people go well someone's going to find out about my show before the launch date the biggest problem you're going to have in podcasting is not being discovered too soon yeah that is not a problem mm. it, ever period even if you think it is it's not a problem um, so get yourself launched and, and then, you know, plan out what you want to do for your episode. And, and here's even more important, figure out how your audience is going to interact with you. Get a Gmail account, get a call in number in that first, very first episode, ask people to send you feedback, even ask them in the trailer episode, 
always be asking for feedback. And the reason that you want feedback is your audience is going to grow based on your audience telling their friends and families about your show. Yeah. When you talk to all the big shows, they will all tell you they did very little. And sometimes they'll tell you they did nothing to promote their show. Their audience did it all. Yeah. So you have to have a relationship with your audience and that starts with getting feedback and incorporating them into the show and you know, get that feedback mechanism set up uh, so that, you know, create a, create a community, get a Facebook page or, you know, or one of the other services, if you don't want to use Facebook, but get some sort of community where people can gather, can come after the show between shows, ask questions, communicate with each other and get to know each other, build, build that, place for your tribe to grow yeah um that's huge so um you mentioned three main steps and i just want to reiterate them mm -hmm. have a trailer make sure that it's released a month before your, your episode goes live and actually you made sure that everyone knew that um when you delivered your presentation uh and it is probably one of the best things because it allows you to do a lot of things in um in a month that normally it gets rushed and gets half-assed if we're trying to launch in a week or in, in a couple of days. So that is, 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 is amazing. Once you get that trailer on, you get a whole bunch of URLs for all the platforms because that allows you to kind of have your podcast page and get people to um, listen on, your, on their favorite podcast platforms. And then I think the third one, which is probably for business owners who start a podcast for the first time and have not been podcasting, interaction with the audience is is like key because I feel like business owners getting into podcasting, all they're thinking about is clients. And there are the two types of business owners that I get. There's the one who um, are very creative. They love creating. They love making cool stuff, but they don't like to sell. And if they sell, mm -hmm. they're selling their soul and so on and so forth. <laughs> And uh, then there's the other kind of, of, of business owner that comes in and says, I'm not going to do this if there's no ROI. I need to know what the ROI of my first episode is. And they land up just creating a podcast to get clients. And the people that listen to their podcast know that they get, they're creating this podcast for clients and they, they're repelled from the whole idea. I would love for you to kind of give us some um, ideas and some thoughts on maybe approaching that differently. And how would you approach that? I mean, starting fresh, if, if you were to start a business right now and we're going to create a podcast to promote that. Right. It's, it's the, do you want to be a sole seller or a sole collector, right? Yeah. Well, you yeah. don't have to, you don't have to choose. You can go in the middle. Hmm. Um, and, and what I tell people is, look, the podcast is ongoing. You shouldn't be pitch, 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 pitch. The podcast should be 95% content, maybe 5% pitch. If you're pitching more than 5 or 10%, it's way too much. Um, you want to you want to sell yourself to your potential customers. Show them how knowledgeable you are about the topic. You don't have to tell them about your product. You, your expertise will come through if you're doing it right. Mm -hmm. So it's and it's not selling. You know, so you're not worried about selling your soul. Now, you also do occasionally want to mention your product or service. You do that at the end of the episode, and you just say, "Hey, you know, if you liked what you heard, or if you're looking for." some help in this area. This is something that I do, or this is a product I have that can help you. And you mention it briefly, but you don't have to go into full pitch mode because by the time they get to the end of the episode, if you did a good job presenting the content there, they have some trust built with you and they're eager to hear that. And you'd be surprised how well the podcast listeners are going to support you if you are giving them something of value, right? Cause they look at it. Hey, if this person is willing to fill up my commute to work, and give me some valuable information while I'm driving to work and help the time go by and, and help me in my life, my work, whatever it is that you're, you're helping them with, um, they're going to return that favor. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, let's talk about value for a second, because I think um, we as business owners might get that value part messed up a little bit because we're like, oh, I want to help everyone. So they need to know about my services. But let's talk about value in terms of a podcast and building value for a listener. How is that different? Well, building value for a listener comes down to this. They have so much time in the day and you have to convince them. You have to give them information in that 
time that you're you're releasing the episode that they feel it was worth worth it that they found value in that um you know the question is how long should the episodes be you know that's the other big question people ask and what we found is longer shows do better but don't make a show longer just to be longer you, you still want to have you have 35 minutes of content you do a 35 minute episode you have four, 50 minutes of content you do a 50 minute episode you can vary length of episodes um but what people want to know is if they spend 50 minutes with you it was worth it to them the, the return on that 50 minutes they got 50 minutes worth of value right uh, content knowledge entertainment it, it helped them go through the day now hopefully you can mix knowledge and entertainment you can make your show not just pure data drop right it's it's information plus entertainment and that's the hard part right those are the successful really successful shows the ones that get both entertainment and educate and, and, and education yeah um, and I think that comes comes with time especially by interacting with your audience and the ones that listen getting them to give you ideas on on how to improve your show and get more interaction from the people that you're you know already connecting with right right and you'll start to have inside jokes and there'll be little things and people coming into the show for the first time might not pick up on the little things but over time they'll start learning and and, and that's where you really start getting that community feel going amazing um I want to talk about a, a mistake that has happened to me um, a couple of times. Luckily, not many. And um, and I wonder whether it's ever happened to you or you've seen this happen. And that is losing your recording after you finish <laughs> recording. <laughs> Do you have a story? Um, on? <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, you, everybody you talk to that's done enough interviews will to give you the story about the time they lost this interview or they, you know, um, there was... Um, there was a, a call service one time that, that you would hit star five and it would say recording start, uh, recording started. And then you'd hit star five, recording stopped. And I did an interview with someone and I hit star five and it goes, recording started. Uh-oh. Uh, uh <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's not good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and what happens? Like, what is the best way? For someone to not make that mistake i mean there i mean is, is it a checklist is it having it's, a backup it, recording it, service if you can do a backup i mean there's been times uh, we do it now lc escobar and myself we do our recording for the feed and we always have a backup we have two ways we're recording we have the service we're using to record and then we each on our own computer have this backup that we're doing a secondary backup because we just it just we don't want to have to repeat that hour you know it's not as you know if we lost it we're co-hosts and it's like, oh, it's a pain, right? It's not embarrassing. But when you're interviewing a guest and you get their time and you lose that, oh, you start you start to sweat. Your head, start, literally, my eyebrows were sweating. My head was sweating. It's just, you know, thankfully it was no video because the person would see me sweat because I was just like, oh, my God, you know, sh and I, what do I have to say to this person now? And they're like, uh, we kind of need to do this again. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, mm. So, yeah, it, it's a horrible feeling when you lose that recording. I mean, yeah. that it, it's, um, it, it's not good. It's not a good feeling, but almost everybody I've talked to, you know, I, I used to do podcast 411 in the early days and, and everybody would come on and they would talk about, Oh, I lost this interview. I lost that interview. Someone would talk about, you know, they, they hit record and they didn't realize they had the SD card wasn't in the, in there, or, you know, they pulled the SD card out while it was still plugged in and it corrupted the SD card. So, you know, things like that, making sure you turn off your recorder before you pull the SD card out. Yeah. There's so many different ways to lose a recording. Um, yeah. And, 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 and here's the thing. Here's the thing. You do enough interviews, you're going to lose one. Just, it's not a question of if, just a question of when and yeah. how. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, one of the things that happened was, um, um, I traveled to New York and I was interviewing the CEO of Vena and we had this great conversation. James Orsini is his, is his name. And I had this great conversation for an hour and because I didn't want to look um, like the tech guy, I did not check whether his sound, whether his microphone was plugged in correctly. And it, it was just crackling the whole way through. And I recorded the whole interview, and then when I went to check it, it was just a bad recording, and it was so horrible. Um, 
I can feel it as as you can feel uh, the one that you lose. It doesn't go away, I suppose. I have one on my desktop. Where is it at? Uh, it's um, there's a media file on my desktop somewhere here. I've got my really bad desktop, and it's a recording with Tim Ferriss, <laughs> and I've never put it live. It's an interview I did with him because when we started the interview, one minute into the interview the next door neighbor's lawn service showed up and started mowing oh. and the lawn mower is running and you can't hear it just ruined the whole recording. Yeah. So I've got that interview with Tim Ferriss that someday I may go through and try to clean up and release it, but it just wasn't, it, I listened to it and it just was nothing I could do. There it is. It's, it's right on my desktop. It's called Tim Ferriss dot wave. <laughs> it's been sitting on my desktop. Uh, let me see when the file was created. Hold on, let's get info. Uh, it doesn't it, it? Doesn't have the? Uh, it, it says nineteen sixty nine. So, but that's wrong, obviously. That's but it, it's yeah. But it's sitting there on my on my desktop. An interview with Tim Ferriss that, that just can't release. That's crazy. And I would I would have just given it to, to someone else to to fix and and um, hopefully not had it on my mind for that long um but oh no we're talking i'm talking this interview has been this has been on my desktop minimum six years maybe Ooh, seven wow yeah. wow um so i i feel a little bit better and um uh, about that vena conversation but uh, for everyone that's kind of you know starting a podcast and you don't want to make a bunch of mistakes uh, we've compiled a list of like 70 mistakes that business owners make when they're starting a podcast. You can go to mistakes.wearepodcast.com and you can download it and we also give you a way to fix some of them. And a lot of them you can fix by just reading <laughs> what the mistake is because you'd never make, get a chance to make it. But it's only when you go through the to the motions of actually doing the podcast that you realize that these small mistakes like the SD card one that you mentioned, only if you have one and you go through it, you realize, oh, I should not remove it while it's still on. I could corrupt it. Um, okay, I'm going to wind up on this because we, you and I have something in, in common. We're both engineers and we both have an MBA. I'm curious to know what your engineering background is and what did you major your MBA in? Okay, so my engineering background, uh, electrical engineering, yep. uh, got my BS in 1988 uh, from University of Dayton, and I was a quartz crystal oscillator engineer. I designed quartz crystal oscillators, uh, including some that have gone into space, gone to Mars, got, I, that are still up there. Um, one of my oscillators I designed used to be uh, in um, uh, in uh, Qualcomm's original units that would be on the trucks those little you ever drive by a semi and you see this little white dome inside there there was an oscillator that was my oscillator so I go down the street I'd see you know my product amazing um, so pitch and yaw and all of that stuff yeah, yeah. well the, the oscillator is more for the timing so it was for the satellite communication for that system got it so yeah yeah so yeah at one point in time my design was out in hundreds of thousands of trucks on the road and every time I could see the little white d dish, it was one of my oscillators that I designed was in there. So that was that was my original engineering was quartz crystal oscillator, very niche topic. Um, temperature compensated quartz crystal oscillator. So you take it down even to another niche level. Um, and then my MBA, um, I worked for the company I was working for while I was doing that was Dover Corporation. And when you got an MBA at Dover, you got it in finance. So my concentration was finance, although I did as many electives in finance as I did in marketing. So I kind of split my electives mm -hmm. and my MBA between finance and, and marketing. But I had to say it was finance. Of course, it was Dover Corporation. And then Dover was all about acquiring companies. Sure. So uh, what do you think? Final question. And yours? Mine. No, no. What's your your side? No. no <laughs> what was your engineering? So uh, I'm um, I've got Indian in me. So uh, we first do IT to figure out what we want to do the rest of our life. Uh, so my engineering was in computer science and engineering. So I did a, a bachelor of computer science, and then I thought I was a technical person. So I got a master's of software engineering, and I did it in process quality. But then I was working for a company uh, that did auto guidance. So tractors would wake up in the morning, go plow the field, come back, mm -hmm. park themselves, and basically all on uh, spatial and um, auto guidance, which is now in a lot of the tels Teslas. So that this was, mm -hmm. I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. 
Um, and they paid for an MBA, which uh, I got in leadership and psychology uh, because I suddenly went from being a quality manager of 30 people to being a global quality manager because they got bought over by this big company. And um, yeah, it was uh, the MBA that opened my eyes into business because I never thought of myself as a business person. I just thought of myself as a nine to fiver until I was exposed to business um, subjects. And that probably is the biggest turning point in my career because seeing that I kind of went, oh, maybe I'm not a technical person. Maybe I am quite creative. And I never thought of myself as creative until 10 years ago, maybe. Um, so engineer, uh, very technical, uh, that has create creativity, uh, that was bottled up inside. So I think I get it. I get a chance to do that now with the podcast, uh, a little bit. Yeah. And in podcasting is just, I, know, I found a great creativity. I got my MBA. And as soon as I got my MBA, as soon as I finished, I got into podcasting. Yeah. And so that's, so that's how you know, mm -hmm. I got into podcasting was having this void in my life uh after the mba was over yeah um before we wind up where can people find you and how can people be in touch with your work sure uh find me rob at libsyn.com r-o-b at libsyn l-i-b-s-y-n.com uh, you also go to podcast411.com find me there or at podcast411 on twitter which usually i'm just talking about sports um i try to keep it more sports oriented mm -hmm. on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, sometimes it's technical stuff. Um, yeah. And but that easiest way to is just email me rob at lipson.com if you want to get a hold of me or you can listen to a, me every other week on the feed the feed uh, dot lipson dot com. You can find us there. Yeah. And um, it's a it's a great podcast, especially for podcasters. So go check out the feed. Rob, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. I, I said it was going for, for 45 minutes. We went for an hour because this is, uh, uh, I, I love having these conversations with you. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for everything you do uh, in the podcast world. I would have not been a podcaster if not for the work that you laid out. And I want to continuously give the people that have come way before me what I call the Mount Rushmore faces of podcasting um, the credit, because if not for the work that y'all put in when podcasting wasn't popular, none of us could have built on that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, if you're joining us and you want an edited version of this interview, you'll find it on chillisatapodcast.com or any of the favorite podcast players that you have. But until next time, I'll catch you soon. Thank you, Rob. Talk soon. Ronsley, thank you.